This channel is part of the History Hit Network. Stick around to find out more. Two thousand and one, an incredible discovery is made in the depths of a Bavarian lake. Everybody who is in contact with this cold run, he's like mesmerized. You know, you can feel its power. It would mark the beginning of an unbelievable tale of intrigue and shady deals. Somebody said, "We found the Holy Grail, and tried to make billions. It must be a big story." <laughs> Could the cauldron unlock one of the greatest mysteries of the Nazis? This thing has some kind of magic, not whether white or black, one can't really be sure. And reveal a secret obsession with the occult. The whole idea is surrounded by fantasy and mythology. To find out, we journey inside a dark fortress at the heart of the Nazi regime. We have not begun to get to the bottom of what really went on there. The Nazi. Temple of Doom. In 2001, an amazing discovery was made in a lake in Germany. In my point of view, it was really one of the greatest mysterious we uh, ever had in this region here in southern Bavaria. Local journalist Axel Effner followed the story as the news broke. There was a diver and another person, and he's go with a metal detector who is detecting archaeological things on the lake bed. And they go to this place and dived about 200 meters from the shore and found this glimmering, glancing uh, cauldron in the lake bed. This is the treasure that the divers found, the Kimsei cauldron, an incredible artifact made of 10 and a half kilos of gold. Decorated inside and out, with reliefs of mysterious figures that would later be described as the Celtic discovery of the century. Writer Andrew Goff was intrigued by the story of this grail-like find and began his own quest to uncover the truth behind its secret history. The entire story about the cauldron and its discovery has been fraught with suspicion. Respectfully, everyone who's touched it literally has been just behaving in a very self-motivated or suspicious kind of way. Were they looking for it intentionally or it wasn't an accident? Perhaps he heard some uh, from some historical sources that there could be uh, a treasure in the lake bed. And the people of this place, uh, they told that after the end of World War, there was uh, divers who were looking for something. And perhaps uh, the cold run could be put there by secret uh, army of uh, the Nazis. There was little reason to doubt Axel's story. As the Nazis steamrolled through Europe, they plundered thousands of ancient artifacts, treasures, and holy relics. Reports claim that over a fifth of Europe's art was stolen. But by 1945, the fortunes of war had reversed. The Nazi regime's days are numbered, and it's absolute chaos. They need to store these relics for a future time, perhaps for the Fourth Reich. So this means hiding objects in caves and even depositing objects such as a cauldron in a lake. Was the cauldron an ancient artifact stolen from occupied Europe? And could its discovery shed light on what went on inside this mysterious Nazi stronghold? Determining the cauldron's age was crucial. Some experts believed it to be over 2,000 years old, 
Others thought it was a modern creation. But what was the truth? History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. There is a great collection of religious history content available to History Hit subscribers, from the Crusades to the birth of Islam. There are plenty of topics to choose from for your next documentary fix. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a 14-day free trial and Parable fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code PARABLE at checkout. Art dealer Kai Schmidt has studied ancient artifacts for over 30 years and soon realized he was dealing with something exceptional. It was very impressive on the first view and uh, the material itself, the weight of the material, the massive weight and, and the effect of the light. If, if, um, the light is, uh, if the light is reflected by such a, a huge amount of gold, uh, it's a very fascinating effect. It's uh, spectacular. Kai analyzed the cauldron's depictions of ancient warriors and their gods. I think the, the whole scenery is something religious. Sacrifying scenes which are connected in the, with the afterlife. It was clear to me that uh, whoever made it was uh, very closely involved or had a very good knowledge about uh, the Celtic culture. The cauldron refused to give up the secrets of its age, leaving archaeologists and academics mystified. But there did seem to be one major clue that could help date this artifact. At first glance, its Celtic imagery is reminiscent of the, the Gunderstrup um, cauldron from Denmark, which is authentic 2,000 years old and has very similar Celtic imagery. Retrieved from a Danish bog in 1891, this priceless silver object was believed to be one of a kind. I find it immensely impressive and quite moving object to look at. Gunderstrup is the biggest and most magnificent silver vessel from the uh, late pre-Roman Iron Age. The Kimse cauldron seemed to be a dead ringer for the Gunderstrup, and an archaeological sensation was in store for the world. In this modern world where everything is proved and everything is scientifically researched and they have answers and solutions for everything, nearly everything, this is a thing which is um, it's something else. In the shady underworld of antiquities traders and their middlemen, deals were struck. Swiss entrepreneur Marcel Wunderly was banking on the cauldron's incredible age and rarity when he bought it in 2005. Wunderly is actively promoting the artifact as one of the most significant artifacts in recent years. In fact, the world has not seen a more important artifact, according to Marcel. Wunderly's team claimed the cauldron was worth $1.4 billion and sought investors. There's a frenzy of interest now in the cauldron. Sure enough, investors come forward and actually invest a million and a half dollars just for the right to help in the marketing of it. To realize this incredible value, the cauldron had to be pre-Roman. Huge amounts of money were riding on it. Metallurgist Peter Northover was commissioned to determine its true age. Working alongside a team in Zurich, one of the cauldron's secrets was about to be revealed. Well, the main technique that was used was laser ablation, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. A laser removed a minute speck of gold from the cauldron's surface, which was analyzed. This gave the team the elemental composition of its gold. So for ancient gold, you'd expect a certain level of tin, of lead, platinum, palladium. The team made a shocking discovery. 
This is pure, modern, almost certainly electrolytically refined gold. Certainly a product of the 20th century. In Switzerland, Wunderli was indicted for fraud and sentenced to three years in prison. As a company asset, the cauldron was seized. It was placed in a high security vault in Zurich. If the cauldron wasn't made by an ancient hand, then who did make it and why? What we can surmise just by looking at it is that it would have been a culture of a people who felt proudly about their ancient Celtic origins. The cauldron had been exposed as a modern fake, but could this strange artifact become the key to solving an even bigger mystery? Had it been made by an organization that was notorious for its obsession with ancient mythology and the occult, the Nazis, In a lake near Munich, divers discovered a gold cauldron. It was being hailed as a Celtic discovery of the century, but scientists soon exposed its true age. Certainly a product of the 20th century. If the cauldron was made in the 20th century, it still begged the questions, who made it and why? Even if it isn't an ancient artifact, the imagery that's on the artifact is imagery that was very important to the Nazi regime. This cauldron, adorned with religious imagery, could offer some insight into the Nazis and their strange beliefs. It becomes an artifact that's a byproduct of one of the most notorious and, and fascinating regimes in history. At the heart of this regime was a powerful inner circle that wanted to promote the idea of a glorious Germanic history. It was the personal obsession of one of the most powerful men in the Third Reich, Heinrich Himmler. As a Nazi, Heinrich Himmler was extremely effective, one of the most effective political operators in the Third Reich. He was brought up by his father on stories of Norse mythology and Teutonic myth. When he got to power as head of the SS, he then had the resources to indulge his fantasies about uh, you know, Aryan mythology. Himmler had his own New Age guru, a historical advisor called Karl Maria Villigut. He claimed to be a warlock and the direct descendant of a line of god kings. He was an habitué of various Nordic mythology societies. Uh, he was also an alcoholic. He was also uh, an extreme abuser of drugs. He was a schizophrenic who had been uh, effectively sectioned in the 1920s, and he claimed to be able to channel his ancestors. Uh, so quite a strange man. Using occult advisors like Villegut as inspiration, Himmler began to formulate his new ideology for the Nazis. He aimed to promote a racially pure society devoted to German greatness and its ancient past. At the vanguard of these new beliefs was one of the most evil groups in history, the Schutzstaffel, or SS. The SS uh, saw itself as an elitist organization, so the men who really were committed to the Nazi cause. Well, Himmler's main task, from his point of view, was to develop something like a corporate identity for this organization. Himmler needed a base for his beloved SS. In 1934, he chose a remote fortress steeped in legends of witch trials, torture, and execution. Vivelsborg Castle, it became the Nazi Temple of Doom. Its past is dark, its modern history equally as dark, and we have not begun to get to the bottom of what really went on there. What connected a cauldron found in the bottom of a lake 
with Himmler's mysterious castle. In spring 2011, Swiss journalist Luke Bergen broke a story in his magazine, Mysteries. According to the report, some personal effects of Himmler had been found in an attic in Germany. Amongst these finds, there were documents that were thought to be of Nazi origin. It's on Nazi letterhead. It's on old paper. It's stylized in the way of other documents from the era. And most every aspect about it just seems to ring true. Dated April 1945, the documents contained a movement order and an inventory of Nazi treasures. There are 35 objects or sets of objects on this list, of which one is uh, uh, called a gold kessel, Keltish. So we're talking about a gold cauldron and it's in Celtic style. And what's being referred to there is the Chinze cauldron. And there was another revelation. There, in black and white for the first time, was a suggestion that the Chinze cauldron was kept at Himmler's fortress. Wiewelsborg Castle. I wouldn't be surprised at all if that's where it had stayed for some period of time. The original documents were inaccessible and could not be closely examined. And in a world full of Nazi fakes and frauds, there was every chance that they were not reliable. More information was needed. The inventory also seemed to reveal the name of the man who made the cauldron, Otto Gar, and its city of manufacture, Munich. Andrew Goff traveled to the Bavarian capital to see if the facts on the documents stood up to scrutiny. So I'm here in Munich to understand as much as I can about Otto Gar, and in particular, could he have manufactured the cauldron? Munich's interesting because it's the birthplace of the Nazi movement and also where Himmler was born. Haydn is a well-established family-run jeweler in the center of the city. German journalists suggested that the cauldron was made at their workshops in the 20s or 30s. It's something that Max Haydn had been looking into. He was certain that the cauldron was made by Otto Gar, the man whose name appeared on the inventory. This is the who is who from the Munich Gold and Silversmiths. Inung, we call that, it's a guild, it's a goldsmith's guild, and he was member of that till he died. And Mr. Gar, he was uh, the goldsmith from the NSDAP. The NSDAP, or Nazi party, was on the rise in Munich in the mid-1920s, and silversmith Otto Gar signed up. He would become the favored jeweler of the SS, making their death's head rings. And Max thought he had more evidence linking Gar to the cauldron. Max's family often talked of a meeting between Gar and Haydn's chief craftsman, Alfred Knotts. Mr. Gar, who was mainly a silversmith, asked Mr. Knotts, how should I work with 10 kilos of gold? According to Max, Gar had made the cauldron from gold pipes taken from a chemical factory owned by a Nazi donor named Albert Peach. For me, it's clear that Mr. Peach has the possibility to take 10 kilos of gold to set um, a piece for the Kimsey Kessel. Otto Gar could have been the natural choice to transform Peach's gold into a cauldron. He made a lot of pieces for the NSDAP, so they trust him. Uh, that means to give him a, a big work, it's natural that they 
won't come to, uh, won't go to the to the Haydn family they will go to Otto Gar but why would Otto Gar have made the cauldron for Albert Peach Peach had made generous donations to Hitler as he bullied his way to power could the cauldron have been another gift to the Nazis Tied up with this kind of thing is, is the whole notion of gift exchange. You give powerful gifts to powerful people to give yourself more power. As ever with this story, it was back to shady deals. The cauldron could have been a backhanded contribution to the Nazis. But what about the inventory? It provided two possible clues, the name of the cauldron's maker and its city of origin. We know with a fair amount of confidence the cauldron itself actually was made in Munich around that time, 1929, 1930, by apparently Otto Gar. So far, the inventory is holding up to scrutiny. But why would the Nazi party create a fake Celtic cauldron? In 1929, the SS had less than 300 members. By the end of 1939, they had over 200,000 true believers. Himmler needed a new religion for his rapidly growing army of black knights. In Himmler's worldview, he saw Christianity as uh, something which was created by Jews in order to weaken uh, the Germanic uh, Aryan superior people. Himmler thought the principle of Christian mercy had no place in the uncompromising and cruel belief system of the SS. He wanted to resurrect the lost religions of a pre-Christian Germany. To underpin these beliefs, he needed to validate the idea of the Germans as an ancient race. The Kiemse called it. Fits very neatly. I mean, don't forget one of the the things you're going to need if you're going to be developing this sort of new cod religion of, of you know, reaching for the stars and all that, you're going to need a, a liturgy and you're going to need liturgical objects. Himmler, Willigut and other high-ranking SS officers were looking to rewrite German history to suit their own needs. In 1935, Himmler set up a think tank called the Annenerbe. He used the Annerbe organization to collect evidence for an alternative history in which the Germanic people played a central role. And he tried to combine uh, academic efforts with mystical ideas. This Society for Ancestral Research would produce their own publications and films, detailing their findings from expeditions to far-flung locations like Iceland and Tibet. They go all over the world in search of proof of the ancient Nordic and Aryan heritage of the German people. At Wevelsborg, pre-historians, genealogists, and scientists were drafted in to help support Himmler's vision. And according to the inventory, the cauldron also had a part to play. The Kimsey Cauldron most definitely would have been a perfect fit because the imagery is ancient Celtic, Aryan, the sorts of imagery that was being embraced by Himmler. But what might the Cauldron's role have been at Wevelsborg? Could it have been the Holy Grail for Himmler's Black Camelot? This thing has some kind of magic, not whether white or black, one can't really be sure. In 2011, a Swiss magazine broke a story. In a German attic, documents reportedly Nazi in origin divulged a secret. A three-page inventory seemed to reveal that the Chiemse cauldron may have been kept at Wevelsborg Castle, the Nazi Temple of Doom. This would have been very important to the Nazis. They would have welcomed such an ancient artifact because they felt that their 
Aryan origins were, were Celtic and beyond. But is there any other evidence the cauldron might have been kept at this fortress of fear? To find out more, we have to travel back over 70 years to the dark days when Vivelsborg was being rebuilt as the ideological center of the SS. Heinrich Himmler and his architects had developed a massively ambitious plan. They envisaged the castle as the new center of the Nazi world. We've got up on the screen plans that Himmler had, uh, had drawn up for Wevelsburg Castle so that when, when the war was won, they could get on with, with creating a, a sort of Nordic Vatican. At the center of this vast SS city was a three-quarter circle fortress with 18 towers and 60-foot walls. The castle that exists at the moment is a tiny fraction of, of the enormous circular construction that was going to be created. It looks to me here about uh, nearly a kilometre in diameter. To carry out his grand vision, Himmler needed workers. Agnes Butner was a schoolgirl living in the village of Wevelsborg at the time. Von da unten, da mussten die einen dicken Bruchstein auf die Schulter so mitnehmen und in Reihe und Glied marschieren und singen dabei. Und dann kamen aber immer zwei Wachsoldaten mit Hunden mit. Ne? Und wir durften denen auch kein Butterbrot geben, aber man hat es ja doch heimlich gemacht. So, ne? Ja, das durften sie dann schon. Ne? Also das, das vergesse ich heute nicht. A concentration camp was built to house these slave laborers. They endured a nightmare existence to bring Himmler's fantasy to life. Nearly 1,300 died. The role of Wevelsborg as an ideological school for SS officers began to change. The castle was envisaged as a site for ceremonies, SS weddings with pagan overtones and baptisms that shunned the Christian church were carried out, many with Villegut as high priest. Torchlit ceremonies celebrating the winter solstice replaced Christmas. Behind closed doors, Himmler could pursue his obsession. The creation of the Wevelsburg was a fulfillment of some of Himmler's eccentric personal dreams because he could actually go back to this um, ideas he developed as a young person, uh, this idea of sagas, of a of medieval world, of a lost Germanic world, and uh, in a way it was his playground. Himmler furnished his SS school with relics and artifacts that celebrated Germanic heritage. Himmler used uh, the castle as a kind of collection place for the treasure he got from the occupied regions during the war. And he had got a lot of paintings here, tapestries, carpets. It was yeah, a kind of treasury room for him. The Reichsfuhrer wasn't the only Nazi appropriating art and antiquities. In the wake of the Blitzkrieg, Europe's most precious objects were plundered in the name of the Third Reich. Teams of uh, SS personnel, uh, including members of the Ahnenerbe, followed behind the invading German armies, seizing the contents of museums and taking them back to Germany. Holy relics were also targeted. In the Hofburg Museum in Vienna was the Spear of Destiny the Holy Lance said to have been used to pierce the side of Christ. And one of the things that interested the Nazis in the Spear of Destiny was its ancient heritage that any ruler who is in possession of the Spear will be looked kindly upon by the gods. It's thought that Hitler believed that whoever owned the Spear would become the undisputed ruler of the world and 
that it was seized on his express orders. These relics were potent weapons of propaganda and could be used to legitimize the Third Reich. If the cauldron had been kept at Wevelsborg, how might it have been used by the SS? The setting of Wevelsborg Castle, this Nazi ideological headquarters, particularly the SS headquarters, that's where you would put it, that's where it would be, and that's where it would be a symbolic object of, of greatest power. In 1941, the SS, Himmler's loyal knightly order, was taking over the world. Himmler was now in a position where he could turn Wevelsborg into whatever he wanted. Himmler was trying to create this idea of a, a sort of knightly order, a bit like the Knights Templar or the Teuton order. He wanted the SS to have that same idea guiding them. Himmler set about creating his own Camelot for his new Nazi knights. His rooms would be named after ancient chivalric heroes like King Arthur. The castle's focal point was a stone-lined chamber where the most senior SS officers were to meet. Well, this is the Supreme Leaders' Hall, which is built in the former crypt of the castle. It is built in a kind of medieval architecture. You have got 12 columns here in this room. And we don't know exactly why the number 12 was uh, chosen by Himmler, but one interpretation is that he thought of King Arthur and his 12th knight. And he wanted to use this room to meet his highest SS men. There's even some speculation that he installed an oaken round table for these meetings. But it seems Himmler's obsession with Arthurian legend didn't end with this room. He began his own quest for the Holy Grail, the cup used by Christ at the Last Supper, said to possess miraculous powers. Himmler was obsessed about the Grail because he believed it would just validate the ancient Germanic origins of his people. He enlisted Otto Rahn, an Indiana Jones-style archaeologist, into the SS. Rahn would scour the Pyrenees for the Holy Chalice, but returned to Himmler empty-handed. Could the pagan-style Kimse cauldron have been a substitute grail? You don't make an object like that without having some sort of public purpose. For it. It, 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 it's a symbol of, it's a symbol of power. You're not going to keep it on the sideboard at home. You, it's going to be part of a display. I think it became a central part of of some kind of series of semi-public, or secret, but but certainly mass rituals of one kind or another. Himmler clearly wanted to immortalise his place in history. He decided to build a crypt at his Camelot. Some claim that this is where Himmler and his most faithful 12 knights would be interred. This is the land of the dead. Well, this is the crypt. Above you have got the swastika symbol. So it was a very important room for the SS. And it should have been used for honoring death SS men. Well, we think that there you can see in the middle of the floor two gas pipes. It's thought that these pipes would fuel an eternal flame and that the death's head rings of fallen SS men designed by Otto Gar would be enshrined here. If the work had been completed, the crypt might have become a site for remembrance. We can have only uh, speculations uh, about what should have happened here. Historian Peter Longerich has written extensively about Himmler and what went on at Wevelsborg. He knows separating fact from fiction is no easy task. 
I think the idea is uh, popular that behind the history of the SS there is a second, a secret history, that um, they had their secret cults, their rituals, um, a secret code, and one can actually decipher uh, this uh, culture and actually find access to a, a, an alternative, a new history of the, of the SS. After the war, the full extent of the SS obsession with the occult came to light. Rumors of satanic rituals and even human sacrifice at Vivelsborg ran rife. But historians continue to reject these claims. The occult theories that the Nazis indulged themselves with uh, can seem silly and almost sort of laughable. The reality is that they were being used to underpin the policies that led to the extermination of the Jews and which led to the persecution of gypsies and Slavs uh, and uh, you know, the disabled and so on within Germany. So they are deadly serious. As the war progressed, building at Vivelsborg slowly ground to a halt. By March 1945, the Nazis and their warped world view were on the brink of defeat. Vivelsborg was under threat. Himmler wanted to ensure that whatever went on at the castle, or was kept here, was going to remain secret. The castle's treasure was on the move. Anything that hadn't been removed in the days and weeks before and taken almost certainly south would have been looted, I think, the moment the Germans withdrew from the castle. So it's quite possible that, uh, that a, an item like the cauldron will have started to uh, make a journey somewhere. It's very portable and it's worth a lot of money. It was time to ensure that Himmler's sacred citadel would not fall into enemy hands. Himmler gave the order to blow up the castle. So one of his officers, Heinz Macher, had to come here and take some dynamite and put it into the castle. With the castle cleared, the order was given. Limited by a lack of explosives, the SS only blew up the southeast tower. They resorted to torching the fortress. When the US 3rd Infantry Division seized the grounds, Vivelsborg was gutted. Maka had been ordered to bury the 9,000 death's head rings kept here. These were never found, and nor was the cauldron. So we know some facts around the cauldron, but what still remains a mystery is how and why did it end up in a lake in Bavaria? April 1945. final victory for the Allies in Europe was in sight. With the Nazis exposed on two fronts, Himmler's dream was in tatters. The Russians are coming into Germany from the east. The British, Americans and French are coming in from the west. Germany is in a state of more or less complete collapse. The treasures that had been kept inside Nazi strongholds over the last six years of war were on the move. Some were being secreted away, others were being used to buy freedom. Heading south, some die-hard Nazis were planning to make their last stand. Himmler and others are from this area, so this is where they were heading for. And at the same time, all the secrets were heading that way too. They were either being chucked into mine shafts, uh, hidden in salt mines, thrown into lakes. So you had a lot of stuff ending up here, and of course an awful lot of gold and silver and treasure and objects. The fate of the cauldron could shed some light on what happened to all Nazi treasure at the end of the war. So how did it end up in the bottom of the lake? The movement order found in the attic may provide more clues. On the assumption that the list we've got is genuine, what we're told is around the 14th, 15th, of April 45, this material, including the cauldron, is being taken from Augsburg, which is northwest of Munich, 
past Munich to the north, undoubtedly, and out to Strakonica. According to the documents, a shadowy SS officer, Hans Joachim von Alten, was ordered to smuggle the cauldron to the safety of Bohemia. Chris Going uses wartime aerial photography to take a closer look at the proposed route of von Alten's convoy. The town of Landshut was of particular interest. This reconnaissance photograph was taken on the 17th of April 1945, and it shows Landshut. And already you can see that it's been quite heavily bombed. Landshut was a strategically important town where the cauldron could have come to a halt. You've got two bridges over the river, and there would have been a huge bottleneck here. With the Allies advancing on all sides, von Alten's convoy would have no choice but to stop their mission to Bohemia. And they could have handed their treasure over to the Nibelungen, a newly formed SS division made up of cadets and officers from an SS training school. There were certainly other SS units in the area, but the Nibelungen are, I think, our, our dramatis persona here. They're, they're, they're the, you, you know, they are our suspects. Himmler named these diehards after a medieval poem referring to keepers of a mythical treasure hoard. Had the Nibelungen become custodians of a modern Nazi treasure? This is where, if our story holds together, this is very much where they would have taken it over. As the Allies advanced, the Nibelungen would have joined the enormous retreat south towards the Alps, where many hoped to make their last stand. On the 2nd of May, 1945, the shattered remnants of this division were close to the shores of the lake where the cauldron was found nearly 60 years later. Had they thrown it into the dark waters, denying their enemies possession of their sacred grail? And don't forget, within the Nibelungen division were true believers. And I think they would have had stewardship of this object, and some of them would have decided to put it beyond human reach. They weren't interested in the value of the object, they were interested in its symbolic purpose. And that's why it ended up in the lake. The Nazis had finally been defeated, along with the ideas of Germanic supremacy that Himmler had preached at his Temple of Doom. Up to 100,000 artworks and relics stolen by the Nazis are still missing, waiting to be discovered. In this story of deceit, secrecy and speculation, not much is certain, but in its 10 years in the limelight, the cauldron may have finally revealed some of its secrets. We know with a fair amount of confidence that Otto Gar made the cauldron in Munich in 1920 or 1930. We know that it was the kind of artifact that would have been the perfect gift to the Nazis. If they received such a gift, it would have made sense to be in Wevelsburg. We also know that on May 2nd, 1945, the Nibelungen were, were cornered in Kim Z. For now, this compelling but circumstantial evidence is all we have to go on. The documents found in the attic remain unavailable, and no historians or scientists can get their hands on the cauldron for further analysis. In Zurich, its last known custodians, the administrators of Marcel Wunderly's bankrupt company, keep it in a high security vault. Does the cauldron even still exist? If it's been melted down, it's been sold, and people are making jewellery out of it, and people could be wearing bits of the Chiemsee cauldron as we speak. You know, it, it's, it's now sort of gone into eclipse. It, it's having its moment in a box. <laughs> you know, it may come out again. We don't know, but at present, it's hidden from view, as it was for 50 years since the war. Maybe the cauldron will emerge into the light again to offer definitive answers to this enduring enigma. Uh, may remain a mystery forever, who knows? And that's fascinating. There are not many uh, things uh, like that in this world nowadays. <laughs>